So um, to be honest, I'm slightly intimidated by the competence we have here now in the audience, um, but I will just give it a try. And um, I'm, I'm eager to hear your uh, criticism of what I'm going to say. So the first part is about construction of derived types. And the other part is about um, two use cases for object-oriented design patterns in um, an HPC application. Well, not in the performance relevant part, but um, well, you will see how it goes. So the first thing is about constructors in Fortran for constructing derived types. And my first notion here is, I would say there are no constructors in Fortran, at least not in the same sense as in C++. Hello? Okay, um, so why I come to say this is because, I mean, look at the left side, you see you have a type, you can define, as you've seen, uh, default values for the type. And as soon as you declare the type uh, in a data section or beginning of a procedure, you can use the type and its attributes and they have the desired values. And there is no way, as far as I know, to run code in that initialization, as for example, in C++. When in C++ you declare a type like this, or in a similar way, you can define a constructor, which is automatically run in any case. So when you have the type defined, your constructor is run, and what you do in there is up to you. So you can start printing out, you can do a network connection or whatsoever. And Fortran really has this strict separation between data declaration, including default values for the data and the actual code you can run. And you see that also that there is no possibility or I think there is none in, in the standard to run actual code before your main program starts. In C++, you can register code or you can make code run before your int main actually is called. And I think in C++, this has caused some trouble, which was fixed in C++ 11, I think, on 14, where you had to introduce an order um, what you have. Because if you have not run int main and you, one object file reversed requires something else to be used, that something else also has to be already initialized. But this is then not actually the compiler anymore, but this would be the linker, uh, which would determine this. And Fortran decided, I think also in a good way, to not allow this. And I think this is probably also the reason why you can't really have a constructor in the same sense. And uh, yeah, the audience, please correct me if, if that's, this is wrong. But I think this is, this is very important for, for newcomers or for people coming from other language to understand this difference. So what does defining a derived type give you automatically? Uh, what it gives you, and this is something I, I used um, Godbold for, the Godbold webpage, you can also use uh, compiler get the assembler output because I really wanted to look at what is is underneath generated and based on that what defining a type gives you is it gives you an initializer which is so, something like a, a procedure like or function on the right not quite I'm come to that um, a copy function which is used when you assign something or to, to copy the type and a v-table, which is used for polymorphism to decide which, if you have uh, a pointer or an allocatable pointing the base class and you call the common function on, on this base class, which was defined in the base class, to decide uh, on which implementation it should go, there is the v-table. I think there is not, I mean, there are compiler people here and I haven't look too much into this, but I think this is similar to what C++ does or how C++ does it. And as you see on the right, what you get is this kind of like initializer function where all the attributes you have, if they are public, um, are taken as kind of like an optional. And if you pass it along, 
then it sets them. Otherwise, it uses the default value. And this would be if you go to, to Godbolt and do minus O2 there and insert the code, this is what you see. And this is why I think the, this happens. So you really see um, there is the copy function, which is actual code. Then you have the read table, which is data, plus the, the initializer at the bottom to initialize the data. The question is now, if you go, let's see, if you go here and then you here, look at here, you see that we have here branches, right? Whether, whether the optional is given or not. And this you don't see anywhere here. So let's dig into what happens when you actually call in a program this type. So I declare the type, as you can see here, define the type, then I initialize it again, some way or another, with value 42. And then here I build it with G Fortran, minus O2, minus S to, to get uh, the assembler and verbal asm to get also the comments so I can see which line is res responsible for the, uh, for the respective assembler output. And also not an expert in, in assembler. So I usually follow kind of like the, the thing here. So what I see here, okay, it's kind of like interleave the print statement here, but for this assignment here, what we see is we get the value 42 written, loaded at a specific register address. So there is no function call because a function call would look like this, right? So if you have the default initializer, the compiler will inline everything automatically for you. Because I, here I made sure that this is, the, the module is in a separate compilation unit. So if you're worried about performance, the default initializer is something you can use and it will be the same as simply doing t ampersand, um, what did I use? t ampersand integer, uh, t ampersand a equals 42. You don't have to worry about any performance penalty here. No copying, no function call. Okay, let's now write um, a constructor as you would see what you can do. Uh, and the standard says that you can actually define an interface with the same name as the structure itself, as the user defined type itself. And if you do that, it will take precedence over the built in. And this is what I did. So I went ahead and wrote this constructor. And I really did what I assumed here as a constructor. Just the name is a bit different, but other than that, it is actually the same. So I wrote this my type constructor um, doing exactly this, what I would assume the, the compiler would do. And if you compile it, you see, and then you call the same main on it again. And then what you see is that if you have your own, even though it does the same as the built-in, if you have your own constructor or initializer, you get actually a function call here and also a copy, well, and also a copy. So this is something the compiler cannot inline automatically as you would expect from function, function call, unless of course you do link time optimization. I've also verified this and the compiler is of course able then to inline this, this properly and compile it down to the same code. The message here is for data classes, where all attributes are public. I use data classes because that's what Python introduced um, not too long ago. Um, for data classes, if you're worried about performance, use the default initializer, which is there. Don't do anything fancy and everything will be inlined. No need to, to worry. But you need custom constructors if any of the attributes are not public. If one of the attributes is not public, it will fail. Although there might be private attributes in a base class. And then the, um, the built-in 
initializer for the derived type is also is, is, is available. Do not call custom constructors from a performance critical section unless you kind of object that LTO will optimize it away because you will get the function call and the copy. You can, of course, instead of this kind of constructor, you could use a type bound procedure for the initialization. And this will give you a function call using the V table, but of course, no copy, or ideally no copy. As I said, uh, link time optimization, FLTO with GCC, inlines a custom initialization function. And I've tested this only with GFortran, so it might also, may also depend, depend on the compiler. This is what I wanted to say about the uh, constructors because that seems always to be kind of a question about, about this. Um, are there any questions about it, remarks from the audience? I don't have the Slack chat right here. So I don't see it. Yes. Ah. Okay, wait. Um, so can you use the dictionary and then Can you use the initializer? Uh, not, not the built-in one. You can use a custom initializer, like the, the one I showed. This interface, you can do that if everything's private or any of the things is pri are private. Actually, you have to write this custom initializer if any, uh, if any attribute is private and they get access to the private attributes of the user-defined type. Good. Okay. I think, we'll there's a subtle, I think there's a subtle distinction there in that if any of your fields are private, but they have a default value, you still do get the initializer, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, this, is, this is very well possible, yes. This could be um, something. If you have any field that is private and does not have a default uh, value, then you need a custom initializer. Yes. So if I would make this one here private, then you should still get the, the built-in initializer. This is what you're saying. I, I think so. Yeah. You'd have to double check me on that, but I, but yeah. I think that's it. It would make sense from the logic. Of, of how, how the initials, initializers work. Good. Um, then I would move on to um, design patterns in practice. Now this is a, a bit of a big, big word. So let me um, put it out. So I will, I will show two examples. So design patterns and, and software engineering um, go, go some way back, as you can see. And uh, of course, the, we saw a couple of bridges yesterday and, and on Thursday um, in, in some talks. This is why I chose here as a, as a symbol for architecture, again, a bridge, this time uh, from Switzerland. Um, so design patterns is notion which comes from architecture. It is about finding solutions. One end is about finding solutions to common problems and how to document those solutions um, and make them recognizable on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also uh, an idea to, to learn those um, such that you, um, that you can also use them to actually um, make an architecture for your program. So it's not only to, to see them when you read the code, that you better understand the code, but also as a tool to make your code more readable for others. And I think this distinct distinction between um, recognizing patterns and being able to apply them is, is also important. 
to do. And you can separate between software design patterns as in the, in the Gang of Four book, um, which I really recommend to read at some point and as a more higher level in architecture science style as in the follow patterns of enterprise ap application architecture. And of course, there are now also scientific application um, or patterns in scientific applications. Some of the books have been mentioned already in the workshop channel, so we will not go too much into detail about this anymore. As I said, what you gain by knowing um, design patterns? Well, in scientific programming, often the programming is straightforward and the levels of interaction can or will often negatively affect performance. This is the discussion we had with Aryan, or a short uh, remark from Aryan. There's the, always the debate when you structure your, your points. For example, you have points in, in space with an attribute. Do you do a multiple lists, one with the point or the coordinates, one with the corresponding value, or do you do a list of user-defined types? Uh, the shorthand for that, this is uh, a structure of lists versus a list of structures. And depending on what you do, this can really affect uh, your performance. On the other hand, what we see in scientific programming is that those codes usually live a long time and they grow. And as we know, growing software, if you don't pl plan ahead or if you don't have uh, much of a plan, it becomes quickly unmaintainable. And design patterns provide a uniform way of documenting those common solution, solutions and problems. And what, what you have seen before, compilers are by now quite an awesome piece of software here, and they can, to some extent, optimize away the levels of interaction introduced by modularization or encapsulation approaches as introduced possibly by such design patterns. And here is the important part. Recognizing is one part. The other part is applying uh, design patterns in code. When starting with, with this, do not make the mistake of trying to put everything into a pattern. Ideally, when you start writing something, it should come natural that you say, oh, okay, this is maybe it isn't this pattern. Then you check whether it is, and then you can document it. Do not try when you write a piece of software or a bit more complex problem to always think of a pattern. There hasn't, there hasn't, to, hasn't to be any. Um, and the same way goes for object-oriented programming. Also, this is a discussion point we had in the, in the chat. Do not try to put everything into an object-oriented programming model. It may not, not fit. And after all, you and also your colleagues have to be able to maintain that. So um, there is kind of like a natural approach to it. If it doesn't come, don't try to force it. But for patterns and for also for object-oriented programming, try to recognize the patterns and the use cases where it would make sense to use, um, to use patterns or OOP um, while writing the code. This means you have to exercise a bit um, to, to get your hands on it and, and to study a bit, but don't try to enforce it. And the literature for this, I would really recommend, even though it's for C++, a book I really enjoyed, is uh, from Herb Sutter, C++ Coding Standards, um, because it really has this, this, even though it's C++ centric, most of it applies to other languages as well. So I found myself using the same advices in C, uh, in Python it's, and in Fortran, of course. And the other one is, of course, the Pragmatic Programmer, uh, which also is in the same way, I would, say, I would say. So the two examples of patterns in um, object-oriented HPC codes I would like to discuss shortly is one hand is the iterator, and on the other hand, it's the command pattern. Um, the iterator pattern, as you can probably know from other languages, provides access to elements of a list or kind of like, uh, elements of 
provides access into lists of possibly complicated or aggregate objects without having you to know how you effectively access those, those nested elements. If you are known or if you know uh, database, databases like um, SQL databases, an alternative name is a cursor. And remember Fortran, at least for arrays, already has um, slice or array slices. So for simple straight striding, um, it's probably still better to, do, to use Fortran. But it can be useful to hide complex access patterns, um, as you will see now, or in the, in the example right afterwards. And it helps to avoid code duplication in loops. So if you find yourself to write multiple times a loop, and everything, every time the preparation for the loop, and also then to kind of like pull out certain elements or sub-elements from, from a list of, of structures, then an iterator might be the thing to, to use here. And I will go to the comment afterwards. So um, the software where we use an iterator is this DBCSR sparse matrix library. You have heard of it yesterday in two talks actually. Uh, it is part of the CP2K electronic structure software package. So it's not a standalone part. And as the name says, it is about distributing sparse matrices in an efficient way. Distributing means on um, a huge number of physical nodes. And how to access them if you have an operation. One of the tasks is, okay, how do you actually iterate through those blocks? And the way we do it is really a simple iterator here in a not time, not using um, type bound procedures. So we really have this iterator class, which wraps the state of your iteration here, or which contains the state of your iteration. You do it by initializing it. Here it's using a start uh, subroutine. Then you have a check whether there's still some work to do and a function to actually get the block. And what you get out of it is then something you can use with your native Fortran tools, native Fortran code. So all the kind of like knowledge about where, how those blocks are distributed and which block to take next is hidden in the iterator. And this, hit, this iterator is even OpenMP aware, which means you can use that inside or not an OpenMP parallel section and it should do the right thing by splitting the blocks on the different uh, threads. It hides all the synchronization and communication. And if you're interested in what, what it actually hides, because it's kind of a large, large block, um, you can download this PDF from the GitHub and go in there in the, those are links down here and look at what it actually um, hides. And as I said, here they don't use type bound procedures um, for, for the stop here. So they, they could, this could be a bit more nicely done, I would say, but it is the same effect. So there's nothing uh, you could gain from it except for, for eye candy. Um, the exercise I wrote about that is write a simple iterator to iterate over the lines of a file. It's, I think, three lines of Fortran code or four lines of Fortran code, I know. But um, the idea is that what you get there with the iterator is an object you can extend with different behavior or also change or make it more complex in the implementation. The first use case though, the first try should be um, pass a file to, to the iterate file unit to the iterator start, do most of the logic in the end or is done function, because that's the easiest thing with, with, a, with a file. And the get or next is simply then the gather of what you pulled out from the file in the, in the end or is done function. This is the most simplest thing. And you find more about this in the description, in the exercise uh, description there especially the how you should be able to use it afterwards. And I have sample solutions for this uh, already um, 
already prepared. And as I said, it's a very simple case, but if you start extending it by additional behavior, for example, um, to be able to strip characters from, from the line, uh, to filter lines as a whole, for example, empty lines, um, or to handle line continuation characters, like we have in Fortran inside there and then return the logical line, this becomes much more complex. And of course, if you then want to use um, an allocated string instead, so arbitrary line length, this suddenly becomes rather more complex than I, I would wish for. And of course, you can go fancy and try to, to do MMAP in here for, for almost zero copy. That's one part. The other part then is, or the second um, design pattern I would like to discuss, and I will keep it short here, is the comment pattern, which has a different approach in the same context. And the idea here is to encapsulate a possibly parameterized request or operation as an object. And you've actually seen that, I think, uh, yesterday in Arian Marcus's talk uh, about experimental Fortran programming, because encapsulating mathematical functions and their parameters inside an object is, in, in a sense, exactly this. And for me, this is a really convenient alternative to bare function pointers, because usually when I have a function pointer to something, more often than not, we get additional parameters we have to feed to this, to this function. So where do you store, keep this parameter and who has to know about it? So the function of course has to know, but what I see is that people are storing this inside, for example, a module, which again makes, doesn't, um, uh, prevents that you can use two times this functional object with different data. So a function object is for me a way to tie together the operation itself and the parameter which goes along with it. And this is something we directly use in uh, our CP2K, electronic structure code. And this is how, how it looks like. So the problem here is you have a, a matrix you want to write out matrix elements and the task was you can do that in multiple ways. One is you can write them in a specific format called FCI dump to a file. The other way is we provide um, a C API to it and we would like the function, we would like to write it in a storage provided by the user in a CRA. And there is a lot of code which goes with it. Again, I will not show the code which goes with it. You can check that out with the links here, but I will see, show you how we use that effectively. So what we do here is I implement this ERI for each function, which you can call. And what you can provide here is a function object. And here I use the constructor, respectively, the, the default um, initializer you get. And you see one time I have an object. This is the one for, to, to, fill, to fill the variables or the, the matrix element into a C array. One time I have it here with the buffer coordinates and the buffer values. So they get two arrays, actually, again question about list of structs or structure of lists. And the other time I have a function object, which is this ERI FCI dump print, which prints to a file. And of course here you get a unit. So this ties together by instantiating this, this class, you tie together the operation and its parameter and you pass that on. And the ERI for each doesn't have to know what it actually is calling. The only thing it has to know that it has, that is it, should do that for each element. And of course, by doing that, I could, I'm not only wrapping there the, the difficult access to it, but also um, I could do kind of caching, I can do kind of like batch processing. 
so that I get uh, the old elements in one row and then simply call the write function, for example, etc. There are uh, multiple possibilities. And what I have, what I initially started with is this abstract type. And uh, Arjen will probably talk about more about abstract types. And the idea is that this abstract type defines a procedure or requires a procedure. And here I have the definition of, of, this, of this procedure. And what you see is, if I say this, this has to be the function object passed to the for each, you of course get um, a reference to, to itself to be able such that the function is able to access its parameters and then the coordinates, the i, j, k, l plus the corresponding values value for this matrix element. And that's all. And function object, which is, which you can pass to the for each, simply has to implement a function with this signature by deriving from this abstract class and then you're set. What did we gain by using this pattern or by doing it this way? Um, we can have the shared data preparation of this matrix element, require some calculation, and the data access encapsulated in the for each. And the only thing which changes, or the only point where you can make changes to how it works is uh, by passing different function objects. And for each loop in that sense, doesn't have to know about the parameters of these function objects as it would have um, if you would pass along um, function pointers. And as I said, this would give us the possibility to do advanced data access patterns in the raw data before calling this function. But again, if you want this really optimized, so this is not in a performance critical part uh, of the code, if you you probably would need LTO to, to optimize this further if that would have been in a performance critical part. And the exercise for that is an extension of the line, write, uh, line reading iterator is write the base class with a transform function taking a string and returning a string. And then implement two different function objects called lowercase and uppercase doing the respective operation of the string. Of course, they will not have uh, parameters yet, but that would be something you could then do as an extension of the exercise. Parameterize those transform, fu uh, transform functions or come up with your own transform function, which requires parameterization. And the final exercise, which somehow didn't make it onto the slide, Anyway, you will find it in the exercise sheet. I have also in the GitHub. The final thing is combine this stuff in a way, let's see. that in the end, the final do while loop in your program is this. So no cases in there, no parameters in there, no nothing, simply a while loop where you can see, okay, iterate over the thing and do the transformation. And everything else should be in the initialization to that. And of course, no cheating, no static or module level variables to do that. Well, that's it. I'm open to questions. Let's see what we have. Ah, the, we have a difference between command pattern and strategy pattern. Um, right. The strategy pattern for me is at the higher level. Um, for example, a strategy pattern could be if you do um, kind of like a minimization, for example, some of the minimizations require um, uh, a preconditioner, for example, before you do the actual thing. 
And with a strategy pattern, I would apply it on this level, is where you could change the strategy of your, of your uh, while loop completely. While the comment pattern is usually a much finer object with, with a more narrow uh, focus. This is how I would uh, look at the different command and strategy pattern difference. Um, whether the comment pattern is similar to the map function in Python? No, I would, I would, no, I would not say that. I mean, my for each really kind of like looks the map, looks like a map and it is, but I think the map function is really, there you really are into the lambda calculus where you of course have kind of like function objects or you do your lambda, you represent your lambdas as function objects to implement them. But I think it's, it's a different thing. So the comment pattern is, is actually my function objects rather than the, the map function. Because you don't necessarily have to pass along those objects to, to a for each function. That's just application of it. You could also build, for example, other objects based on those commands. Or you could, instead of simply iterating over those, those commands, you could put them on a stack and then start working on those commands you had and possibly implement some kind of undo by still remembering uh, all the operations you did, all the, the different commands you did. So I think there is a distinction between this. Yes, and now we have again the, the, the Rousseau book uh, about uh, software, scientific software design. And it seems there's also a, yeah, some examples in there to read. And I think I skimmed through it, but I didn't do, uh, do much yet there. Okay, I think we can take it more to the discussion offline and I will leave the room again to Arjen. <clears throat> right. So that's uh, uh, another set of uh, exercises. Um, I was thinking about your uh, uh, extension with uh, uh, printing only the nth uh, uh, line. Uh, that should be done in the in the loop itself, right? Not in the transformation. The the what the? Um, the 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 loop uh, to filter out only the well to to print only the the nth line. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, variations you uh, described. Um, right. That could be done via the loop rather than via the transformation, right? Exactly. That would that would be the application of the strategy pattern. Actually, yeah. if you would factor out this, you could you could on the other hand also put it in the iterator, kind of like call it an nth line iterator. That would mm -hmm. also be a possibility, of course. Right. But definitely not in the transform in the transform function or function objects. No, that would be indeed a different, uh, different thing. Okay, shall I continue with my, uh, uh, my bits? Yes, please. Right, here it comes. If all's well. <clears throat> <clears throat> 